You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 112. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and foes. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. Of course, I'm never not going to shout out my Patreons, my people who give small amounts of money every month to help the podcast keep going and bringing everyone free content. Guys, this podcast is entirely free because of Patreon. So if you believe in accessibility, if you believe in the arts, if you believe in circus, go to patreon.com slash the artist athletes. I want to take a moment to just recognize one of my Patreons specifically one of my Patreons, Laura. Shout out to Laura. So here's the deal. Patreons, when you sign up, you get the episodes early. So I schedule them for production. They go down the line. And before anyone else listens to these on Monday, my Patreons already know what's up. They've already listened to the episode. They're already talking about it. They're already in on it. And sometimes they get a version that's a little bit less edited. It's a little bit crispy. And Laura was amazing enough to write me on Sunday and be like, hey, there was a problem with last week's episode. And I was like, oh, crap. And we could fix it really fast for Monday. So thank you to Laura for being what my Patreons do the best, which is make this podcast even better. This is a community effort, guys, and I am here for it. So join us. Patreon.com slash The Artist Athlete. It's got a ton of behind the scenes stuff, some little offers that I give only to Patreons and so much more. Patreon.com slash The Artist Athlete. So as this podcast has grown in recognition, in reputation, which thank you so much for sharing this, telling your friends, subscribing, doing all the things, I've been able to up the caliber of the guest. Not that we didn't have amazing guests from the very beginning. I mean, come on, like Fred Deb in the first 10 episodes, like give me a break. I had a collection of episodes that I was like, oh, man, these are like the OGs of circus. These are circus icons. And it is so cool to kind of have a month to bring them all to you. So this is episode two in my like little circus icon. I don't know. Series. Yeah. This is episode two of my circus icon series. And I was so nervous to interview this person because she is Someone who I used to watch when I was little on the Cirque du Soleil DVDs and be like, wow, I want to be just like her and I will never be like her. I was so blown away by her. And what's interesting is I knew that she had the traditional Russian circus upbringing. So I kind of knew what to expect from this interview when we sat down. So I was really nervous, but I was also in a way prepared to know certain things about her life. But I wasn't expecting these insights that she gave on things like motherhood, how she navigated her pregnancy and motherhood during her career and what advice she would give to other people who are pregnant or becoming mothers and also want to continue to do circus. And she also gave really broad and untraditional perspectives on what a career in the circus could be after you're done performing or training or teaching or whatever you're doing. So I thought that was really cool. And so the way that this interview kind of works is the first half is really talking about that traditional Russian lifestyle, being in Cirque du Soleil, all of that. And then as we get deeper into the interview, 20 minutes, 25 minutes in, she really opens up and starts to talk about some other things. So this interview kind of has like a warm up period. I think a lot of my interviews do, but like really listen in on this one, guys, because Elena Lev has some incredible advice. My guest today is Elena Lev. She was born in Moscow, Russia in 1981 and began her training to become a rhythmic gymnast at an early age, assisted and coached by her mother, Elena Lev Sr. We love the power move of the matriarch naming her daughter after her. Come on. She developed a signature hula hoop act incorporating gymnastics and contortion. And her big breakthrough came when she was invited to join Alegria touring troupe of Cirque du Soleil. She was a member of the troupe from 1994 through 2000. She also performed briefly with Kidam, Wintook, and Zumanity in Las Vegas. In 2019, Lev joined the cast Return of Alegria, reprising her famous hula hoop number. 
And during the pandemic, she relocated to Montreal, where she lives with her daughter, Varvara. Varvara? I hope you, I say your name right, and I'm sorry if I didn't. Here's my interview with Elena Lev. Elena Lev, welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. For those of you who are only um, listening to this, Elena is drinking a very refreshing drink that I kind of wish I had <laughs> out of a wine glass that has her logo on it. And that right there is goals. Like, that's who I want to be when I grow up, for sure. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Yes, uh, it is pretty hot outside today. And my go to drink is either a coffee or a very dry rosé or a white wine. So right now it's like we're doing this as saint cassette kind of thing. And uh, yes. yes, it is a special glass. It took me some time to actually create and design my logo. So um, and a very good friend uh, from a show designed those glasses for me. So I'm really happy to um, have them. So cool. Yeah, <laughs> that's so cool. Um, I'm so like, I'm like, damn, she even designed her own logo. What can't this girl do? It took um, time. Let's start at the it beginning. Took time. <laughs> no doubt. Um, but let's start at the beginning. So Elena Lev, for people who don't, who don't know you, which blows my mind. Um, can you explain a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, well, hello. My name is Elena Lev. I'm originally from Russia, Moscow. I was born in 1981 in Moscow, December 1st. So I'm a winter baby. Uh, both of my parents are uh, world-class gymnasts and then later circus performers. And when I was five, my mother took me to two different gyms. My father's artistic gymnastic and my mother's rhythm gymnastics. And I was um, able to play in both gyms. And then I got to decide uh, what I wanted to do. So, of course, as being a girl, a girl, as I tell everybody, um, I chose to be in rhythm gymnastics. But I told my mom that I really want my father's trampoline in uh, the gym because I liked jumping. But uh, later on, that dream came true. So my favorite apparatuses were, of course, hula hoop and a ball. Um, I was in gymnastics for about six years. I... Um, made to juniors when I was nine in Bulgaria. I got a silver medal. And then later on, my father was traveling a lot with circus. And uh, at that point, he had like um, a lower to the ground, like bar act that he was doing. And then he decided to create his own high bar act. So we were very separate a lot. And so he said, you know what, let's take her out of gymnastics and we're going to create something so we can tour and travel and work together. So my parents decided mm -hmm. to create something unique that's never been done. Um, and because hula hoops was an apparatus in gymnastics, in rhythmic gymnastics and in circus. But at that point, hula hoop uh, was looked at like a little bit of a vulgar kind of apparatus in circus for, you know, um, I don't want to offend anybody, but for like a wife and a daughter and a sister, something that kind of was done a little bit on the side, not really a true act. So people didn't take it seriously. So me, I was 11. I was very small. And we decided to create an act that's never been done before. You know, a little girl doing hula hoops, uh, integrating handstands, flexibility, hand balancing, dancing, and rhythmic gymnastics, and creating a unique circus act. So that's when it all started in uh, 1993 on April 30th. That was my first show. Oh, my God. You know the exact date. That's amazing. I do. I do because I had to recently uh, go over some, you know, uh, memorabilia. My mother sent me a bunch of pictures and videos, and the exact date is there on that VHS huge cassette, you know. So it is, yeah, April 30th, 1993. Because some people think that I started, well, you know, later on and sort of display, but I didn't. I started way before and um, traveled, uh, you know, a little bit around Russia with my parents. So that was the beginning of it all. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I feel like that's also very true of like back in the day, like drag and like the old school yeah. Cirque du Soleil shows was yeah. the performers weren't just these kids who were like fresh out of school, right? They were like yeah. circus families or they had, yes. what is, yes. what is the, they had grinded their teeth, chopped yes. their teeth, something yes. like that, yes. like on yeah. the stage before getting to yeah. Start. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Because it was, you know, it either circus schools became a little bit later uh, no offense to mm -hmm. them. They're fantastic. You know, it's something unique where people do different apparatuses. They get to learn different things and then graduate. But the true circ, you know, the traditional circus exists 
much, much longer than uh, Cirque du Soleil or any other. You know, it's been around the world, especially in Europe, like Italy, Mexico, uh, Switzerland, you know, uh, France, Russia. It's been there for many, many years, I believe like 150 maybe. So, and the traditional circus, like you grow up in the family into, I like the saying of like the inside the horse poop and the smell and the whole thing, you know, you, you get <laughs> yeah. that. The, the true taste of uh, the, the, you know, the circus, the round uh, manege and the whole thing. So it, it's real. It's like it, there's no other way you're going. You're going in a circus, you know, and uh, you sell popcorn and balloons and uh, you tumble and you practice. And yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it's the world. It's the world for sure. I'm interested. I'm thinking about all of my listeners who are came from the world of gymnastics and transitioning mm -hmm. into circus mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I feel like that's a really specific. All of them have the like wrists and you know they do a lot of yep. the signature gymnastics thing. And I'm interested to hear like that first act that you made or with your parents. How was it to transition from gymnastics to circus and like what was the thinking behind taking that artistry and turning it into a circus act? At that time, uh, in like the early, you know, like late 80s, early 90s, um, the gymnastics was not part of circus yet. It came on later, which is, you know, very beneficial for a lot of uh, tumblers and acrobats and, um, you know, that created many acts later. Uh, rhythmic gymnastics was something unique and never been really transformed into circus and you never really want to see uh, a gymnastic artist on stage circus is circus it's performing it's art it's different kind of thing gymnastic is gymnastic so i got very lucky because even before joining circus my my parents uh, my father who was in artistic gymnastic who um taught me you know like push-ups pull-ups uh sit-ups uh, he would do conditioning with me he taught me how to do handstands i was a rhythmic gymnast my mom who stretched me and i've done a little bit of contortion then and the back and the choreography and of course the ballet bar so i had the balance of the two so i never really looked like a rhythmic gymnast at gymnastics i wasn't like super tall and skinny but i wasn't really looking like a gymnastics on the circus stage so that kind of benefited me and so so from a very young age, as much as my mother, who is my choreographer and my, you know, mentor, I still had my dad who would uh, support me in the other things. And the goal was not to look like a gymnast on stage. So it's, it's unfortunate because being a performer and an artist, you know, they say like you can do tricks when you're training, but you cannot perform or you can train and you cannot compete or it's the other way around. And some people have the package, some people don't have the package. You know, sometimes you cannot take out that gymnast out of the person. It, it takes time. For some, it's natural. It's like being an actor. You know, you're either one or the other. Of course, you can teach it and you can learn it. And, you know, it's it's practice, practice, practice in front of the mirror on a daily basis. But there, there are some performers that you look on stage and you go, oh my God, it's rhythmic gymnastics or it's acrobatics or it's you know, you know, just totally. gymnastics, just the gestures of like the hands and the, you know, so it's, it's sometimes yeah, yeah. it's tough. It's, it's like, you see it really well, but for me, I guess I wasn't in gymnastics long enough at the same time. It gave me that structure, that base, that, you know, the other stamina, the, the, you know, uh, all the choreography and the, the stuff, and then it transferred into the circus. So I, I got fortunate, but of course I worked hard in it, you know, with different choreographers and including my mother and my father always had an input as well. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of people work with me, including myself for many years later on. So, yeah. And as you mentioned too, you had so much stage time at a really young age and I feel like yes. nothing makes you a good performer. Like having to perform on stage to an audience over you and over have and to over be natural as yeah. well for sure it's it's also mm. it's not easy you have to be natural you know some people have stage fright i'll be honest with many years later on i got more nervous you know because when you're young mm. you have that ability of 
not really caring. I remember when my mother would be more nervous for me than I am. And I would just go on stage and do my thing. You know, I knew what I had to do. I had it in my head. I just had to follow, point my feet, don't drop the hoop and different things like that. But she would be so nervous. With the time that it came and I realized like people are watching me and I'm solo on stage all the time, I became a little bit more aware of what was going on or who's watching or who I'm performing for or how I want to perform and what I'm looking to deliver. So it, it varies. Yeah. <laughs> Do you still get stage fright? Uh, I haven't been on stage in 15 months. Um, <laughs> the last time, uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, she's like, what is a stage? I don't know. <laughs> no, no. Well, the last uh, show that I have performed on was Allegria, the full circle, you know, the comeback of Allegria and a New Light. And mm. um, yes. when I did the- when I did the creation, we opened here in Montreal in 2019. Uh, every day, every day, because I was uh, realizing what life I have lived, what I have done, who I became for so many people. I, literally every show, I had a friend, a fan, somebody that was watching, you know. And at some point, it became so overwhelming to me. It wasn't a stage fright. It was a little bit of like anxious anxiety kind of thing. And at one point I said, okay, Lena, you have to stop. You're there for yourself. You're there to enjoy and do. And no matter who is there, you know, I deliver 150% every show. It doesn't matter how many shows a week I do. It always has to be the same. You know, I, I plan in my head and for my body, if it's eight, if it's 10, if it's how, how many I have to do, it's going to be the same for the audience, you know? So I had to kind of like close myself off and say, you know, stop, stop thinking, stop noticing, just, just you go out there and you deliver and you do it and you have fun. Otherwise it becomes uh, too much. It can get overwhelming for sure. And this time it did a little bit more than, than usual. It was a special comeback. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> let's talk about that. So for the audience that we've <laughs> lost, um, let's talk about Allegria part one, first yeah. of all, the, the Just, act yes. that's uh-huh. so memorable. Um, <laughs> did you build that act for Cirque du Soleil or did you have that and were performing it for a while? So the act that you see on the first Allegria on the DVD, obviously I'm already 19. By the time the DVD came out, by the time the YouTube came out, it took already many years. I joined Cirque du Soleil Allegria in 1994 on July 7th. So when mm-hmm. Allegria opened, my father was there with his original act of High Bar. Uh, me and my mom just tagged alone. And then after a while, somebody saw me training in the training room here in Montreal and in, in the apartments. And they're like, oh, you should show your daughter. She should, you know, like a Audition for the shows and when my father like approached one of the people they said hula hoops will never be in our circus this is the phrase that I will never forget because <laughs> you know again coming back to the traditional circus <laughs> and hula hoop we were like of course okay so we were like well just you know take a look you don't like it you don't like it so when they saw me I was this teeny tiny 12 year old little girl I had my act already that I've performed in uh, around Russia for over a year I was already doing a handstand and splits and the hoop on the foot and four hoops and the slinky the whole thing you know the act was created so they were like okay well this is not what we thought it is so in a little bit after they they proposed they proposed to me first to go to Mister which was uh, already performing in Las Vegas and we were like okay it's okay we're going to be separated again but it's work and then later they changed their mind and they said how about you join Allegria because we're missing acts so I started with my act um, and while Allegria was in Quebec City I went back to Montreal for my own creation for about three weeks designing costume, designing music, working with choreographers and contortionists and my mother, the whole thing. So the act was created, recreated. Basically, I had the act, the base, but we had to, you know, fit it to the show and um, to Cirque du Soleil. And then uh, I joined later Allegria in San Francisco, where I had everybody work on, you know, with me, Franco, Debbie, Jill, everybody, everybody. So yeah, the act became, at first, it was like a backup act. And then later on, not long after I became, you know, the original of the hula hoop of the Allegria. My original costume was yellow. That was created for me. The exact one that you see on the DVD, but a different color. 
But later on, when I left Alegria after Biloxi, Mississippi in 2001, I graduated school and I was with a show for seven years. So I decided that I was kind of done. I needed to do something else. But later on, they called me back to do the DVD. So I went back, but with the condition that I want to change my costume. I was 19. I was a little bit more of a female-like, you know, build to my body. So the little yellow costume just didn't suit me anymore as a personality and a character. And I didn't feel so comfortable. So that's the one you see on a DVD. That's why that green costume and the the look, the serious uh the ice queen look that they call me, you know. So uh, yes. yeah, so that's that's the DVD that you see. So yeah, I was already nineteen by then. I was already like seven years into the show. So yeah, when someone gets into Cirque du Soleil, or when someone, you know, like it's usually their dream, or they've been wanting it for a while because it has a name or it has a thing. But for you, what, what was that experience like having your act accepted? It is so weird because. Um, I'll tell you this later, but I'm currently writing a book, which is my biography. And every time I go back to different um, different days and dates and time, and that's why I say when I came back to Allegri, it went like flash backwards. You know, when they say your whole life yeah. flashes in front of your eyes, this is what happened to me when I came back to the second Allegri. I was like, oh my God. So... I do not remember July 7th. I know the exact <laughs> date because they calculated and they count in this system. They give you jackets and gifts. So I remember the exact date. It was in San Jose, California when I did my first uh, show because I also started as a nymph character before my act was integrated in the show. So I was part of the show a little bit already slowly in. And then my act, when it was ready, they put me in. Again, at that point, my parents were more nervous than me. me. I was putting on my makeup. I was excited. Mm. You know, I was part of Alegria. My parents, my mother, my father were here. I was finally uh, allowed to enter the artistic tent. I could eat in the kitchen with everybody. I started going to school. I felt like, oh, my God, you know, I'm part of part of the cast. I'm, I'm an artist. But I was 12. I was still a kid, you know. So, of course, like. It, I, I guess it was overwhelming. I was super happy for sure for those things that I could hang out with the artists and the backstage. And I was so cool. And I had to do the makeup, you know, and my hair up. So, but I still, I still had to train mm-hmm. hard and I had to go to school uh, in French Canadian. So uh, that's why I speak French too. So my days were, my days were long. My, my life became saturated and intense as much as it was Cirque du Soleil in the best years and the best tour and the best show, the iconic, I, I had, you know, I worked hard. I worked hard. It was not fun. Like people think uh, my mom hates that word fun, fun. Oh my God. Did you see how, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of hours that are put hmm. into this uh, work a lot when I look into my videos and pictures and things that I've done, I go, oh my God, my daughter goes, mom, how did you do this? I go, I don't know. I don't know how at that point, like going to school, having promotions, you know, trainings, 10 shows a week. My act was seven and a half minutes. It was like crazy. I don't know. I was 12. I guess I was having fun That's somewhere. <laughs> So yeah, so I mean, I was traveling the world. What else did, did you, you ever for? remember, like wanting to stop? Did no, you ever want to? Did would, you ever like? Do you ever remember being like? I would not change a thing. I wouldn't. My life has been fantastic, mm-hmm. you know, without the challenges. I think I remember wanting to stop or quit maybe later in my days or age, but not at that time. But at that time, uh, if I would say I don't want to do this, you know, my mom would look at me and go, "What?" What did you say? <laughs> like, what do you mean you don't want to do this? <laughs> no, like, you know, I, I was doing it. I loved it. I liked it. You know, again, it took me time to realize what I was yes. doing and how I was doing it. The people I was later influencing and, you know, sharing this with. But, um, yeah, yes, it was amazing. Okay. Of course. <laughs> so what was the decision to leave Alegria like for you? I was uh, 18. My mother left because I was 18 and they said, okay, you're a solo act. You're all grown up. You don't need a coach anymore. I graduated high school, the, you know, second or cinq en français. 
And at that point, I was always a person that was looking for more. You know, I did Alegria. I grew up. Um, uh, it was kind of like I needed something else. I, I was done being that girl in that little yellow costume. I, I wanted progress. I wanted growth. And uh, till this day, I'm always looking for something to evolve and grow in my life. So, and I wasn't ready to be like separated from my parents. They, by that time, they were in Las Vegas. We already lived there. My father worked on this there. And my mom just said, okay, well, you're 18, but that's it, you know? Uh, so when Alegria, we were in Biloxi, Mississippi for about a year and a half. And then when they decided to um, send it back on tour to Australia, I said, okay, that's it. I'm leaving. I'm going to do something else. At that time, it was the year of 2001 when the events and special events and private parties and gigs that just started so it was like the boom the beginning you know so it was that time when i went back to vegas and me and my mother like we created a website i did resumes we filmed my act in different costumes different musics you know i, I was growing i was happy i was doing something else and i started doing events for cirque du soleil at that time, they had like this new thing, uh, special events, and then for other, you know, people in Vegas and outside of Vegas. So uh, that kind of put me outside of Cirque, and it's always good to come out of that comfort zone, you know, for your growth and to really taste and compare the two. And this is how I think you become uh, a better and best performer when you explore when you when you learn when you grow when you you know do different things you're not just sitting comfortably um on one spot you know i mean it's amazing for sure but god forbid something happens then you're lost in your world and you're like oh my god what am i going to do so uh that first step you know allowed me to 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 do things on my own and kind of not be scared not to be with you know a permanent contract and to slay and also grow as a performer and an artist and do other stuff so with the same act, you know, same act, you know, uh, meaning uh, the choreography changed, the tricks evolved, uh, but I've never done anything else but uh, the hula hoops that I've created. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, because I, I, as you're talking about growing as an artist and as a performer, because that is something that I think is so unique about circus, you know, like I think about. Um, musicians and how you can kind of watch the evolution of their music over time and how they explore different genres of music or they explore these things. Actors, the same, they'll take a role that you're like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. You know, they kind of evolve their careers. With circus performers, we have like our discipline and of course we're going to keep doing it because we've trained so hard and like you get to a point where like very few people in the world can do what you do. So why would you do anything else? So where are the opportunities or where did you find the opportunities to grow as an artist and as a performer if you're doing the same act over those years? You know, I've always been asked like, oh, do you want to try something else? Do you want to do something else? I'm like, why? I've created this act. This is my act. I was the first, the youngest to do hula hoop on the foot, in the handstand with contortion, something unique that, you know, we came up with and we've done. So why would I go and do something else? Um, to the people, um, you know, that are trying to copy or try to be like somebody else, I usually say, okay, it's nice that you want to be me, but how about you find something that works for you, that, you know, makes you that unique performer and artist on stage. And another thing is that, you know, like when you graduate from circus school or you're in a family traditional circus, you know, you have different uh, opportunities of uh, you can juggle, you can pull a hoop, you learn handstands, you do splits. There's all kind of variety of things. And those things are also fantastic, you know, because we do need uh, people that do variety of things. For example, circus will hire a house troupe and it's acrobats that are versatile. They can do tumbling as power track. They can do acro whole Russian bar, you know, um, if you're a gymnast, you can do a uh, high bar trapeze, mm. you can do uh, straps. So of course we need those people. And it's amazing when you can do multiple, it's, it's harder. It's harder because I've seen people go from, um, uh, you know, you're a solo. I want to be a solo. It's harder to be a solo artist because when you are in the group, you know, you can change, you can rotate, you can, you know, be out, you can do an easier trick, a harder trick. There's, there's more room to grow because, you know, you're, you're in like a, a group. Um, 
which I'm not saying it's easy because you have to work with other people. You rely on your porters, on your flyers. You know, it, it's, it's hard work too. But when you're a solo, you are by yourself on stage. You need to make sure that people look at you and watch you. You have to attract. You have to pull that energy. And it has to be good enough that people watch you. And then again, uh, you know, I tell sometimes my students when I do uh, private classes, uh, they go, oh, I want to learn this trick. I was like, okay, you know, it, it may be a little bit hard or it can be different. Yeah, but it's fine. And they do it and they go, see, it works. I said, okay, well, now do it 10 times in a row. What do you mean? I said, 10 times without, you know, falling or dropping. Okay. And then do 10 shows a week. All right. And then do 10 years in a row, 10 shows a week, 10 hours a day with the same level, mm -hmm. same result, same quality. And then they look at me with these big eyes. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so when you find something unique like this for you, and there's, there's many artists, but there's only a few, you know, uh, there's only one Chris Cremo. There's only one Victor Key. There's only one Isabel. She said, there's all those unique people in the world, um, that are like, you can watch them and watch them and watch them. And it's just like, um, you know, I, I sometimes think, say like, oh, I don't like this discipline, but this person I will watch because there's something about him or her. So it, it's, it's always important, I say, to find something that's yours, you know, that's not just because mm. it, it's, I mean, I'm honored and I'm humbled that people want to be me or they want to be like someone else, but it's already done. It's already been done. It's there. Yes. Of course, when it's a, you know, it's another tissue or another strap or another russier, but there's still got to be some kind of uniqueness and something that is, you know, it's not copied or it's been done, but you're trying. And so uh, it's always best to find yourself because then it's like, it's like the clothes fit, you know, you cannot wear my shoes or my pants, you know, or the style or the design, it's all different. So you find something that works on you and it's you. So that's the best way I mm. see it that, uh, you know, could work for anyone. Yeah, for sure. Finding the thing that makes you different or makes you yes. you. Makes you you, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Totally. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now that we've talked about Allegria 1 and <laughs> everything that went into it and who you were at 12. So <laughs> because as I'm talking to you, I'm like, oh, my God, it's so unique in that you would be called up and asked to do the revival of a show that you had started when you were 12 or well, I mean, yeah. Then you mm -hmm. did your solo act in, um, did you bring back the same, like, what was that conversation? Like, did you want to be a part of it at first? Like, tell me how, how that happened for you. Well, I, at that point, um, I was performing in Zumani. I've never stopped performing. It wasn't like some people think, oh, I did Allegri. And then they asked me back like 25 years later. I'm like, no, that doesn't work that way. Uh, <laughs> like, I, no, I, I have to pay my rent <laughs> in the meantime. So. No, yeah. but I've never stopped performing. Uh, only for the time yes. I was pregnant with my daughter. And that's it. Uh, <laughs> but I've never stopped performing. I did so many shows, so many different uh, events and private parties, worked for other companies. In the meantime, I uh, did six shows for Cirque du Soleil total after Allegria went on Kidam. I did Salty Banco and Zaya to replace a few acts. I did the original Wintook for four seasons in New York. Um, and then I joined Zumanity. So at the point when I was in Zumanity and I was already doing school and different things, I was looking at other things. What can I do after Cirque? Uh, because at that time, you know, I was already in my 30, whatever, four, five, six years. And I was like, okay, eventually, you know, I started to get a little bit tired, a little bit of body aches, had already a few surgeries done. My daughter was growing and I had to already think about what's next, what's, what's after, because it will be over anytime. You know, the, the act that I've done and been doing for 27 years, 10 shows a week and boom, boom, boom. It's a wear and tear, you know, it's a, it's a solid thing. And um, I delivered as much as I can and could and did. So at that time, um, we decided to do a reunion of Allegria because one of the directors and people said, oh my God, you know, I hear this this show and Algeria was closed after its 19 years. So it, it wasn't around anymore. 
But the show was so unique and so iconic. It, it, it reached so many people, so many fans. And a lot of people in Cirque du Soleil actually started with Alegria. Like so many people that joined and came and are still, you know, at that time were in Cirque. And so it became kind of like a big thing. So we decided uh, with a few artists in Las Vegas that were part of Alegria, our uh, original, uh, decided to do like, like a reunion. And the reunion was happening uh, in Las Vegas in the headquarters. And we invited a bunch of people. We pulled all the pictures, all the different things, which so created this like huge event for the 24th anniversary of Alegria. And then we heard the rumors that they were bringing the show back. And we were like, oh, my God. And then they heard the rumors that we were doing the reunion. So the whole thing kind of merged together. <laughs> And we did the reunion. We managed to fly in and gather 140 people that were part of Alegria throughout the years, including the original, original, wow. original characters, singers, physiotherapists, clowns. Like, it was so amazing. Like, people came from around the world. Uh, it was such an amazing event. And literally at the event, they announced that Alegria is coming back. It was like, oh, oh my God. At that time while we were doing this reunion i was like oh my god is this my life story is this a full circle am i like what what's cool am i like mm -hmm. i started thinking they sent me my costume the green costume i performed my act at the reunion and at that time i was approached i was thinking you know i was like i think this is it because i was starting to think that that's it i'm settled in vegas louis Zimani is going to be my last show i'm going to become this you know person working after an office whatever so, yeah, so they approached me. I approached them. I said, yes, I was interested. Uh, they were saying that Alegria is coming back as in the new light. It's a new show. It's going to be re redone, redirected with the old story kind of thing. So it was like refreshed because, you know, we're, we were 2000. 19 to open you cannot do the same thing that was done in 1994 and people grow up and change you know it's it's the new millennium it's the new century it's the new everything but of course people are like ah oh, we want the thing the same and so it, it was you know when i signed the contract and they approached me with like what they were going to do and the character to me i was like i totally agree because me today and me then and in the years that I've grown and in the shows that I've done, it was still me when we designed the costume and we designed uh, the music. But it was me today, not me then. But when I came on stage mm. in my movements, in my tricks, in my eyes, in my character, my goal was to deliver that people who knew me then and will know me today, they will see the whole story. They will realize the whole transition and transformation. And after each show, people are like, yeah, that works, you know, because I couldn't come out in the same green costume with the same music. It would have been funny, <laughs> you know. I mean, I, I would do it, <laughs> but it's not the same. So the way we decided to yeah. recreate the act and give me a different music, they gave my music, actually, they refreshed it. They gave it to the fire guy. And then he would appear into my act. And there was a total connection. People that knew the show and knew us then. And now they, they got the whole story. They got the whole connection. So it worked. It worked. The costume worked. You know, the music, the character. It was still me with the same face, the same look, the same tricks. But the delivery and the presentation and what I had to say at that point was different. So it was fantastic. You know, it was full circle. Oh, hey there. I just wanted to interrupt this interview real quick to just say one real quick little thing about myself, which is that I am not only the host of the Artist Athlete podcast. No, no, no. She is a business woman and I run a whole company dedicated to the education and inspiration of circus artists. That goes from people who are just doing it weekend warriors as a hobbyist recreationally, or if you're a professional, you've put in the hours and you need more resources, go to theartistathlete.com. There are a ton of recorded workshops, online manuals and eBooks, everything you could possibly need from me and from some guests on this show about everything from nutrition to training your shoulders to really specific aerial moves that you need to master. Again, theartistathlete.com. And just because you went there from listening to this podcast, Use code podcast and get 15% off your entire 
purchase. That's right. Theartistathlete.com. Use code podcast at checkout for 15% off your entire purchase and have a great day. Back to the episode. As a performer, you need to know when to leave at the right moment. Uh, God forbid you have to stop because of pandemic uh, now that we have an option, an injury, um, something else, you know, or you may get fired, who knows, different stories. So <laughs> if you are at the peak of your career and you've done everything and I've done everything, you know, it's important to, to, to know when to go, not to just squeeze the last drop of the lemon and go, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. I'm going to cut this trick and this trick and this trick, but I'm still going to, Mm-hmm. Me, this was the last thing that I told myself that when the moment hits that either I'm not having fun anymore, either I'm not, you know, like uh, either I'm tired, my body speaks to me, I listen to my body, something hurts. I could ignore, before I could ignore the pain and I was going for it. Time goes by, the years go, I'm going to be 40 this year. People look at me and it, it's like the time stopped. It's like they look at me and go, oh my God, Elena, we wish you to be forever on stage. I'm like, thank you, but you're mean because, you know, it hurts. So, <laughs> so I like, I appreciate that you want me there forever, but I'm not immortal. You know, I'm not, mm. I'm not like this. Totally. Uh, they, they they sometimes don't realize, like you said before, that it, it when you do it professionally for so long, and I've done it again for twenty seven years, including plus gymnastics, plus more, 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 like so intense that your body at one point screams for help and goes, "I'm done, stop this," you know, and then your life brings you other priorities as well. So before this was my priority. You know, it's a thing that I, I mean, still is, it's, it's something that I've done and created and totally. I live, lived and lived for. So, but it's, it's, it's good. It's good yeah. to know when you're done and to be at like, at peace with it. For okay. sure. No, I love that. Yeah. And I, I've heard people describe it as like, it's like the party and you never want to stay until like the very end of the party, you know, and be like the last yes. person out when they're like, okay. Yeah. And then you regret, you know, you want to leave in the parties. Yeah. Still. Yeah. 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 That's kind of it. That's how okay. I feel. I mean, it, the pandemic did it all, but it could have, yeah. you know, it could have, it could have been worse. You never know how your body like, seeing how it reacted and what happened to me in the last uh, year, you know, physically and emotionally and everything. I'm like, God forbid, sure. like everything happens for a reason. Like I like to say all the time, everything at uh, the right moment, at the right time, at the right place. <laughs> you know? Yes. So, yes. Um, I actually want to ask you um, another question about kind of listening yeah. to your body and these kinds of things, because I know a lot of my listeners are really interested in, coming back to performing after pregnancy Ooh, yes. and what mm-hmm. that journey is like. Well, I was young. I was 23, you know, uh, okay. Russian 23. I watch some of the performers right now. And um, unfortunately in, in Cirque, uh, we are pushed a little bit to the limit because we are so eager to come back or lose a contract or lose a spot that uh, unfortunately a lot of women don't get that time with the babies or being a mother or breastfeeding or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, we, we get eight to 10 to 12 weeks. Um, and then it's like, you push, 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 you go, go, go. Me, I was 23. Mm-hmm. You know, I performed until I was four months. My daughter was born and I went back when she was four months. I also, you know, I was fortunate to have my mom there who didn't work and would watch her. I also went back because I was young and because... I was eager to come back to performing. I was eager to get back to, you know, doing what I love, but I always came back home and was a full-time mom. Later on, it became like, I'm a full-time mom, but I'm a full-time performer. So I had two priorities and she Mm. knew that. And she knows that till day one, even until she was with me now in Alegria, she knows when mom's performing, do not touch, do not bother. But when I'm not, then I'm all hers, you know? So, um, listening to your body look everybody is different right everyone does different discipline everybody before pregnancy has a different activities uh, workouts uh, food uh, habits um, you know how how they do it during pregnancy right now I see people and it's so uh, it's like a new thing where they 
do yoga and they stretch and they bike and they run while they're pregnant you know before it was kind of like oh my god i'm pregnant i i'm done i'm not doing anything i'm not moving and then you become like you gain the weight and then you try and struggle to come back it's a little bit different right now and again if you're lucky and you've been a performer and a, you know athlete all your life you know don't stop keep on going again you know people you have to see the doctor you have to make sure you're healthy you may it's it's a different story for everybody me i learned to listen to my body not long ago you know like i used to ignore it and just mm-hmm. push it push it through you know like training wise pain wise oh painkiller oh, a little bit of cream oh i'm not going to eat like stuff like that the thing is when we ignore all those things warming up eating well, sleeping well, prepping and all that, it unfortunately hit us a little bit later. Just when we're younger, we don't notice it, we don't realize it, and we go, ah, it's fine, you know, like, it's okay. But later on, the body goes, oh, remember that day? Remember you forgot to eat or you ignored the warm-up <laughs> or you like, you know, or you did this to me? Trust mm. me, you know, so... I say, you know, do what you do, do what feels good for you, what feels right for you. Of course, follow, you know, your your body. I wouldn't rush into things like that. Some people I see are doing what's good for them. Again, everyone is different. There's not one person alike. Yeah. And pregnancy for a woman is something Mm -hmm. unique and special. And I feel super happy for the ones that had their babies during the pandemic when the shows were closed. I I was looking at all my friends that had like kids and babies on the shows in Vegas. I was like, Oh my God, you're so fortunate. You don't have to rush. You can stay home. You can get back to your, you know, routine. And it is so important because I'll be honest with you. My daughter is 16 today. And when people ask me about pregnancy, I go, I don't remember. I, I missed all that time. I didn't like have the time mm. of enjoyment of that mm. it's such a like valuable moment and it only lasts a year right you're only pregnant i mean unless you have more kids you know but it lasts a little bit you know but it, it goes so fast and then the first year of the baby goes so fast so now that i see in my age right now i i'm i'm jealous to see those people that actually enjoy the wow. moment Take your time and, yes. you know, if you're going to come back, you're going to come back. This will not come back, you know. It's unfortunate because oh. this goes by so fast. So, uh, but don't abuse the body. Just, you know, uh, listen to it for sure. <laughs> That's such amazing advice, Elena. Oh, my God. I love that. I was Because <laughs> there is in the culture like this, like, I've got to get back to my before yeah. baby body. And I've got, you know, like all of that pressure that like, I've got to be able to do what I could do before I had a baby. And, so, and it's yeah. like, I don't know why. Baby. Enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I, I, I right now work um, in a physiotherapy clinic and I have women. Uh, my boss is a woman and she's a new new mom. And it's, it's, it's weird that I was recently had a conversation with her and I was like, how do you feel about that? Because she's, um, she's, she's a specialist in that field, actually. So, uh, and she's like, you know, us as women, and I wanted to ask her because, you know, I have a bunch of performers and me and I said, you know, like, what do you think of this? It was actually the conversation recently. She's like, it's weird Mm -hmm. that us as women, we feel pressured. We feel pressured because we feel like, oh, we're pregnant, oh, we have a baby, oh, we have to, when, um, you know, not trying to be feminist or masculine, you know, for a man, they train, they work, you know, the woman's pregnant with kids, but they, they're working. For us, it's like, especially now a days, in, in the last many years, uh, we still work, we still study, we still have the baby, we're pregnant, then we're eager to come back quick, 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 and pretend like nothing happened. You know, like, oh my God, I just popped uh, this human being out of me, gained some weight and back and I'm already uh, hanging on the trapeze. How is this normal? (laughs) (laughs) So it's like, why, why we do all this work, you know, for, for two, for three people. And it's like, so don't feel guilty. Take your time, gain some weight, rest, you know, and then come back. The work (laughs) will be there. (laughs) So, (laughs) Yeah. That's such amazing advice. I love that. 
after performing for you. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you're you're working in a physio clinic. Yes. Um, what else are you gonna do? You're like the performers I know, the people who kind of like they still have that attitude of like I always want to push. I always want you know like I want to say perfectionism, but yep. that has a different yep. kind of thing for everybody. For sure. But yeah, you get it. That drive is still there. And I'm so interested to know, like, where you see that drive taking you next. My drive, yeah, my drive is for sure there. I'm driving somewhere every day all the time. Uh, Look, (laughs) uh, before I went back to Alegria, uh, I was, you know, fortunate enough that um, I was part of Zumanity, but I was not on the full-time contract. And now I say that I'm fortunate because that kind of pushed me to the way of, okay, what do I do next? Where am I going to go? Um, a lot of mm. people think, oh, you know, you can coach, you can do classes. This is something that a normal thing for a performer, you know, especially now during the pandemic, everybody's doing Zoom, everybody's teaching, everybody's like, you know, I am not. <laughs> so I somehow, <laughs> I somehow decided that I was going to go in a different field as much as I do do private classes. I do it by request if people want. It's something that... Um, I enjoy, but I don't look for it. You know, if people request mm-hmm. and they want, I don't say no. Of course, it's it's just something I do and I'm, I'm good at it and I can do it. But it's not my passion. My passion was performing, but my passion is not mm-hmm. coaching or teaching. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can, but it's not my priority. Uh, so I decided to go back to school when I was 33. I went into food and beverage management, something because I was in Vegas and it was hospitality. So I graduated. Um, and then later on, I did different jobs. I did work uh, at a fitness studio in, in Vegas. I taught classes, a bunch of them, hula hoop, flexibility, contortion, you know, different things. Um, so then I worked uh, at a, you know, at a liquor company. Then I worked for a convention. And then I did an internship uh, in Zumanity for an assistant company manager. Later on, I had a temporary full-time job as an assistant company manager. So I decided that being a performer and the background, you know, the experience and the artist that I could um, help and work in also in the office and help the people like in the, in the office and the artists merge together and understand each other because it's always uh, often very, very lost where the artists don't understand what they're, you know, what they need and what they want. The other ones don't either. So I kind of uh, like to be this mediator so when I moved to Canada last year, um, literally in the middle of pandemic, um, I moved here because I speak French, because I graduated in French Canadian, because when I came here with Alegria in 2019, I fell in love with Montreal all over again. And it was like flashback. And I said, OK, I'm moving. But when I didn't know. So last year I decided to move. And I applied for all kinds of different jobs. You know, my resume became big because I did all that experience. Um, And I got very lucky. um, Well, very lucky. Uh, My knee was hurting. So (laughs) my best friend took me to um, uh, her friend, uh, to a physio who uh, helped me. You know, at that time, everything was closed, but they were working. And it's actually a pretty big company that later I noticed that I actually went there to see an osteopath when I was here with Alegria. Long story short, it became like uh, this whole labyrinth puzzle thing. So I ended up just sending later my resume and they were looking for somebody. So I started in October of last year. I started working first as an ad- like reception administrative kind of thing. And now later on, I am now the administrative assistant, assistant slash manager to my boss in this little clinic, um, Action Sport Physio. So I am working my brain. I love and, them. Um, That's where I go. <laughs> yes. yes, come to me. So I work. Yeah, in, shout uh, out to Action Sport. Yay. Yes. So I work at the TMR, so at Ville Montréal. It's a small clinic. It's a new clinic. Uh, It's been there for three years. So, uh, so yeah, I've been there for almost nine months now. I love it. The team's fantastic. They take care of me because my body needs it. So I literally landed in the perfect spot, perfect (laughs) place after my, you know, performing career. Uh, They treat me. They take care of me, and I take care of them. 
So, um, you know, but, 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 but I will for sure uh, continue, you know, looking for other different projects, maybe little performances here or there, who knows. But definitely I have been reached out uh, by other companies and saying like, oh, yes, we want to work with you. I'm ready to share my knowledge, to share my experience, to work with the artists, yes. to teach, to give classes, you know, and all of the above, because once a performer, always a performer. And I think I, as much as I was going to try and run from it or want to ignore, it's mm-hmm. going to be there. So I think it's going to be the perfect balance for me. Uh, I enjoy now working with my brain and taking care of the people. But at the same time, of course, something's missing, you know, something's lacking. You can't just shut yeah. down like this. After so many years, it's impossible. It's impossible because the drive is always there, you know? So, yeah. Absolutely. I love what you're saying, though. I was like, you guys couldn't <laughs> see me, but I was like, vigorously <laughs> nodding my head when Elena was talking about that disconnect between, yeah. like, yeah. performers and people who work in management yeah. or the company yeah. office side of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I, and I hope Cirque does that more as they're kind yeah. of rebuilding and, you know, coming back. They um, do, they do, they, are... they, they do, they have this, uh, they had this program that's called like Crossroads because they started, they've seen a few people, including me when I joined the I and I decided to do the internship in Zumanity, I was in the office, but I was going down to perform and then I would go back to the office, sit in a computer, answer the questions, do all this stuff for the artist <laughs> and then go back on stage and then come back in between shows, do what they needed and then go back, you know, and everybody was like, First, they were like, are you crazy? And then later it became so normal that they were like, Elena, I said, hold on, right now I'm warming up. Come back and see me yeah. between shows. I'll answer your questions. You know, it became <laughs> like, so they do. And they did have this thing that's called Crossroads and where you could interested and try a new position, a new job, because the life after Cirque exists. It's just us as performers, a lot of us don't want to realize it. We don't want to think it, but you know, um, unfortunately, the pandemic, you know, and I say this now in a lot of my interviews, have a plan B, have a plan C, plan your life, take the time while you're still performing and enjoying what you're doing to see what are you interested in after? What can you do after? What can happen? What are you interested in? There's so many people around you as, you know, technicians and uh, costumes and makeup. There, there's so much that any of us can do but it, totally. it's important it's important to prepare and now we know that we have to because we don't know anymore what's gonna happen tomorrow so i i say go for it don't wait and find something again within you that you know i understand that we all just want to be you know clowns <laughs> and stuff but um <laughs> at, 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 at some point you know we can all we cannot all be coaches we cannot all be it's it's so much and so many so find something else that you really like because you never know you 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 may like it as well so yeah for sure yeah (laughs) oh I love that too because I I was meditating on that earlier about how Yeah. yeah unfortunate it is that the presumed trajectory is like performer and then you coach and it's like well actually there's so much that needs to go into circus and there are so so many performers who are so talented in ways that are not necessarily mm. coaching, you know, like, mm. and it's surprising because, you know, um, I've seen performers when we did the reunion, uh, that came and they are doctors and nurses and psychiatrists. And I go, Oh my God. Wow. And, um, I've seen artists on Allegria. Now we played a little game and it was like a questionnaire game that you get to, um, write the questions about yourself and then you put it and it's anonymous and people pick it and it's like basically like you have to find who this person is by answering those questions and some people had some amazing talents you're like oh my god how are you how are you what are you even doing here <laughs> you know <laughs> they're like gymnasts <laughs> and acrobats and they're on stage but they have like a freaking bachelor master's degree in biology or like <laughs> i'm like are you kidding me and and the girl's like 27 i'm like i'm like dude leave the circus go <laughs> you know it would but, be- it, it's, but it's you know it's so addicting again once you're in the circus it's it just sucks you in there's there's no way it's it's scary there's no way out like it's forever it's forever in your blood you know yeah. it's it's amazing it's amazing for sure yeah. but 
some people are there's so many and much hidden talents beyond all of us that we just have to dig 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 deeper you know <laughs> so you'll be surprised yes. what you can, what you can find that. sometimes yeah you'll be surprised that, oh my god i can do this wow <laughs> you know? and my brain's actually working i didn't know i thought i could only flip you know <laughs> <laughs> so, Imagine that. yeah yeah so so yeah oh, <laughs> Elena, we're coming to the end of the interview. I have one more question sure. for you, sure. Um, sure. which I ask all of my guests. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's kind of funny because you've given so much good advice already. But the okay. question is, what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? In the beginning of my career, I would probably start a journey. Um, like I said, I am writing a book right now. And it's such a, oh, like a diary, like a journal. journey. Yeah. Yes, a journal. Yeah, because uh, okay. the book I'm writing right now is my biography. It's a life story of a little girl, but then it comes to the whole thing. And hopefully it's not just going to reach the people, the artists, the circus, but it's going to reach some, you know, regular uh, women and female and single mothers and performers. So um, I yes. think I would, I, I wish... You know, I was fortunate enough that at that time, uh, you know, there was still cassettes and videos and pictures that my parents recorded and registered everything because those days and those times, the documents and the things, they go by so fast. So um, I would say enjoy every moment, you know, write a journal, record everything, you know, take pictures. Um, don't mm. get like, you know, listen to people, but listen to yourself, listen to your body, you know, work on the things that work for you and only you that make you unique. Uh, follow your dreams, uh, make them big, dream big, um, establish some goals and follow them. Don't give up. Don't look back. Don't listen to the people that, you know, if people talk about you. It means that you're worthy, that you mean something to them. They look at you and, um, they wish you bad it means that you're good so um follow your heart you know and if something <laughs> if something if something doesn't work there's always another path we have choices you know um work hard in your life that you have choices because when you don't have a choice it's unfortunate but we always have a choice if one road or one door doesn't work another one will always open and will always happen but you have to work for it you have to go forward and you have to you know think and listen um intuition is a big thing your heart will always lead you to the correct thing of course you know think and be smart but um enjoy it i mean you know follow your dreams yeah, yeah. do you know the title of your book yet yes i do can you tell us it's called My Life Through Hoops. And it's the exact thing because I thought of it and I'm coming to like a little bit more than the middle um, of it. Uh, and I'm writing it with someone every week. And it's like a therapy, wow. you know, it's like a therapy. And the last week, the chapter that uh, I wrote that we talked about, it, I was like, oh, my God, the, the whole title makes sense now. Because my life through hoops, it doesn't mean, again, I don't talk about just, you know, hula hoop and being who I am. There's so much to it. And it's exactly as it states, completely my mm -hmm. life through hoops. That's so cool. Elena, I can't <laughs> wait to read it. I will Thank want you. a signed copy. But yes, for sure, yes. <laughs> um, and I'm sure everybody else out there can't wait for it to come out either. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It was amazing. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> That was my interview with Elena Love. Elena, thank you so much for coming on the show. I cannot wait to have a celebratory rosé with you on a terrace in Montreal sometime really soon. A couple of things that I thought of while I was listening back to this episode. The first was there was a question I asked Elena and she answered it really differently than even I had asked it. So I asked her after her time with Cirque and doing this hula hoop act for so long, like, how did she keep innovating? How did she keep growing? And what I was really asking was artistically, was she making any new choices? Was she learning any tricks? Anything like that? But the way Elena answered it, 
I think is much more revelatory of where her mindset is. I asked her about the artistic aspect, but she actually started to refer more to growing as a whole person, including as a businesswoman. So if you were in one, I mean, you can imagine this, if you were in one job, if you worked for one company for, you know, 12 years, and then all of a sudden you wanted to freelance or work for yourself or become a consultant or anything else. That's kind of like what working for Cirque du Soleil and then setting out on your own feels like. You have to really cultivate yourself not just as an artist, but as a business. And Elena was really explaining how she grew in that way in the answer to my question, which I thought was super cool. Another point that was really unexpected in this interview, I she brought up motherhood. And so I kind of took the opportunity to dive deeper into that because I know a lot of my friends, fans and foes listening out there want to become or are already mothers and are curious about what that looks like in relation to their passion, their profession, their hobby, their love of circus. And so I asked Elena about it. And it was funny because talking before to her, you know, at the beginning of the interview and her talking about, you know, her mother hating the word fun or her mother looking at her crazy if she were to say she wanted to quit, which she never would, you know. And then she starts to talk about pregnancy and gives this advice that's very much in balance with a little bit more of what I would call a more like healthy approach to a change in the body. You know, she says to listen to your body, take your time. And the wisdom within that is that trust that if you want to come back to circus, you're going to come back. Just trust that. Allow that to be there and also enjoy the fact that you have a child growing inside your body and that time of being pregnant and when you give birth to that child and in that first year that you don't come back to. You can never revisit that. That's a once in a lifetime. And no matter how many children you have, they're different children every time. So it's always once in a lifetime of that pregnancy and that child being in their first year of life. And I know it sounds like kind of uh easy to just say, like, you have permission to take your time and gain the weight you need to gain and don't feel guilty about it. It's your time to enjoy that process. I mean, what the hell do I know about it? I'm just a single, unwed, childless 34-year-old who, you know, has two cats. But Elena Love is a mother and a circus queen, and she is giving you permission to take your time, gain your weight, not feel guilty about it, and trust that if you want to come back, you will come back. And that leads me into my last and final point that I was really thinking about and got out of this interview, which was that I think so many people, when they want to transition out of performing, when they want to leave performing, there's kind of this route or this assumption that the next thing you do is coach or teach. And that's like, that's the trajectory. That's just how it is. And Elena said this really great thing. She was like, you know, I, I will teach if someone asks me to, but it's not my passion. It's not what I love to do. And I think that's so important for people to hear because just because you perform or or even just because you teach doesn't mean you have to be a performer. There's so many different things in circus that you can do. As I was listening to this, I was reflecting on my own journey, um, transitioning out of becoming a full-time performer or fighting to become a full-time performer. And people always ask, what are you going to do next? Are you going to coach full-time? Are you going to open a studio? I was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. And then I kept going on this, this road that is the artist athlete. And I realized that my passion is to, you know, talk into a microphone or create entertaining media that's like informational, but also kind of silly on Instagram or scout talent for various projects. There's so many things that I love to do that I can stay involved in the circus world, but also feed my other talents and passions. All of that is to say, don't sell your circus career short. Do start planning what you're going to do next. But there is room in this industry. There is so much room and need for innovation and talent in ways that are not just coaching or performing. If you're interested in all the things Elena Love did, is doing, and will do, you can go ahead and follow her on Instagram. She's at hoopsact underscore Elena Lev. And I have also put in the show notes a video link, a YouTube link to her iconic Alegria Hula Hoop Act. 
And as always, for aerial training tips and inspiration, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm at the underscore artist underscore athlete. My website is www.theartistathlete.com. I'm on Facebook, The Artist Athlete, TikTok, The Underscore Artist Underscore Athlete. And if you love what you are listening to, you want more of it, you want more people to have more of it, go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete and sign up to be a Patreon. Thanks for listening, friends, fans, and foes. I'll talk at you next week. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, my name is Noah and I do hand balancing. Hi, my name is Woody and I do Leo walk. Thank you for listening to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Hi, I'm Freya. You can hear my whole story in episode 50 of the Artist Athlete Podcast, but I'm here to tell you about something else that I do. I'm a qualified health and nutrition coach. I help people with sleep and body confidence, among other things. You can see everything I have to offer at wildguidance.com or follow me on Instagram at wildguidance. Hi, everyone. I'm Dominique, a ground acrobat, trapeze artist, and coach, currently bringing circus to the extremely cold but very beautiful northern Ontario, Canada. Circus has changed my life, and I'm so grateful to everyone in this community. Find me on Instagram at domupsidedown or my website, domupsidedown.com. Aloha! My name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slacklining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and swing and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we've got a place for you. 